Warning. The media that is about to play will contain graphic and foul language, but is intended to be entertaining, at least to some. The opinion shared here may not be shared by everyone, and may even be just for laughs. If you are easily offended, don't have a sense of humor, have your head up your ass, love patting yourself on the back, or don't even attempt to be a good person, this isn't for you. Everyone else, please try to have fun, and as always, stay creative. Hey everybody, welcome to the Brian Silverback Show. I'm Brian Silverbacks. This installment is being brought to you by Capron Streams. Today I'm talking with Jeremiah and Joseph about their comic book, so stick around. What's up guys? What's up Jeremiah? How you doing? What's up Joseph? Hey, what's going on? That's From probably- sunny Ohio. That's probably the only time I'm going to do the Joseph jo- uh, Jeremiah thing. Like, I'm going to lose track. <laughs> so you're both in Ohio? Uh, I'm actually in Florida. Oh, shoot. That's awesome. Oh, well, I guess it's not awesome. There's a hurricane there recently, right? Uh, no, we, we dodged it. <laughs> it dodged you, I thought. It, like, it just said, no, nah, I'm not going to Florida. Fuck it, I'm out. <laughs> Pretty much. Not a whole lot of hurricane action in Ohio, though. Uh, uh, I can't remember the last one. That we had. Like, do you get no, tornadoes I, I there? Mean, <laughs> yeah, they come through like I don't. I want to say the country, but uh, more rural areas, but not as much as like uh, Kansas or anything like that. So where at in Ohio are you? Northeast Ohio, right side, of, right outside of Akron. Uh, is that close to the Great Lakes? Yeah, we're about an hour away. Oh, that's not terrible. So. So where are you in Florida? I'm in Tampa. Oh, Tampa, right? So you're on the opposite side of the state. Yes, sir. <clears throat> now, is there a difference between St. Petersburg and Tampa? Uh, I mean, not much of one. A lot more old people in Tampa than St. Pete. Oh, really? They both have. Both. Have, other than that, they're pretty much the same place. All right. How did you two get to meet each other? So I'll start on let Jeremiah take it off from where I'd um, leave off. But Jeremiah had posted it was conducting comic book um, artists and professionals group, I think. Okay. And um, he created this awesome character uh, we called Pathway. And he designed the cosplay and everything, designed the character. Um, it's a character with cystic fibrosis. And um, he had posted that he was looking for an artist to kind of – design or illustrate or you know make a sketch of this character and when mm-hmm. i saw it i instantly was like let's do something more with this <laughs> let's make it a comic book i write comics so i want i really wanted to get an opportunity to do like a cause-based book um something that you know we could do a lot of good with because you know comics are great entertainment yeah. but then they can also be used for good for good um and i'll, I'll let jeremiah take it from there all right, Jeremiah, yeah, tell me where the inspiration came from. Uh, honestly, originally it was just something I was going to do to uh, basically make flyers to just hand out information about CF because I myself actually have it. All right. Um, and so once Joseph said, you know, was like, well, this you know, might be good to do more with, make an actual comic of it, it just kind of ran from there. Now, when <laughs> but, you um, – When as you he said, I actually do have the whole cosplay made and everything and wear it to conventions, so – that's all, I have not seen pictures. I'm going to have to see some pictures of that. But when you created this yeah, character, I'm... what what is it an exact mirror of of your or is it just sort of like uh you I let me see. I don't know how to say what I want to say. Did you create uh, the, the character yeah. to be like a super version of yourself or is it just a character that also has what you have? He is more made to be a super version of myself. We even based his appearance off of me in the costume. Mm -hmm. Um, But I actually named him after my younger brother because he also has CF. And watching him, he's a lot sicker than me, though. And watching him fight throughout the years is actually what's kept me going. So I kind of want to do something to honor him as well. Forgive me for not knowing the names of all the ailments, but describe to me how cystic fibrosis, like what what part of the body does that affect and how how does that affect how you deal with life uh it's a degenerative respiratory and digestive disease that we're born with Mm -hmm. um basically it makes my lungs fill with mucus and eventually my lungs will shut down it affects everything in my digestive system 
Uh, t- we tend to get diabetes, which I actually had as well because of it. Oh, wow, dude. All right. Um, I think they actually I th- did a movie about it not long ago called Five Feet Apart. So I don't know that I've watched that one. I did watch Seven Pounds. Not that it's the same topic, but <laughs> did not like the way that whole thing ended. Yeah. I think cystic fibrosis is what I believe the doctors thought I had when I was smaller because I had asthma and I had a digestive disorder that they, they were separate things. Ooh. But they were worried that I had that, so a possibility. So describe to me how your character. What what are your character's superpowers, though? Uh, he's more of a tech based hero. Um, like the easiest way we've been describing the comic it, it, as a whole to people is think like old school Captain Planet, where he's fighting bad guys that represent like different struggles. Okay, but with a more like like '90s Spider Man look to the comic. Well, it's right. educational but fun. Yeah, so the depression monster comes in and 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 this is the guy. What's his name again? Pathway. Pathway. And Pathway is the one mm-hmm. who shuts him down. And then at the end of the story it's like, what did we learn on today's episode of G.I. Joe? Basically, like the the educational part in the actual comic is is kind of subtle if you don't already know about it, but then the editorial page at the end goes a little bit more in depth to the things uh-huh. we hit on. So you, yeah, we what, wanted to keep it more, more friendly, um, and more just like superhero based, rather than hitting people over the head with, "Hey, this is an instructional, <laughs> educational device." We wanted to make it like, you know, a McFarland Spider-Man book that they could just pick up. It's a lighthearted read, and then if they look more into the character, they can, you know, see the subtleties and be like, "Oh, this is actually about a cause. This is about a condition that people are suffering with." Is that going to be every issue, or how far have we planned the whole the whole line for him? Uh, as far as this one, we have this issue almost completed, and we've actually just figured out the layout for the second one. Um, but we're not sure exactly when that'll be done at, but we plan on doing as many as we can. Um, we, our sponsor is even talking about possibly doing it as a webcomic and things like that. So. Oh, wow. So have you, you've already got the first issue, like, kick-started or something, or how do you plan on attacking this part of it? Uh, at the moment... Um, our, between our sponsor and out of pocket, we we've covered everything for the first one, but we are going to do a Kickstarter to try to get at least some of what we had to pay out of pocket covered back. Um, because since we're doing it as a nonprofit and like just giving the book away, uh-huh. we we're trying not to have to pay too much out of our own pockets. So, I mean, we don't want to lose money, but we're not trying to make any either. You know. Now, have you like legally done the whole we're a nonprofit organization that that whole business thing? Or is that just what your plans are, like outside of the like that environment? At the moment, it's just what our plans are. Um, we are looking at doing the legal part of that after the first book's completed, so we actually have something to show for it. All right, then you're gonna have to start filing taxes and all that good stuff. Exactly. Oh man, it just seems like a lot of headache. Not that it's not for a good cause, <laughs> you know what I mean? But <laughs> as a small operation, there's just so many tasks you can have before you just. Like, throw your hands up. Yeah, so we're we're all volunteer based except for the inker and the colorist on the book, mm-hmm. um, and everything is kind of you know out of pocket. But Jeremiah, we're we allowed to mention our <laughs> um, charity partner or our um, yeah. nonprofit partner. Okay, so yeah, absolutely, it's, it's a Colton Underwood's Legacy Foundation. Is that what it is? Yes. Is that how you say it? So, mm-hmm. um, so this uh, charitable organization, Jeremiah can go into it more, but they provide. Um, like medical devices to help people with living with cystic fibrosis live a, a better uh, lifestyle, I think. Yeah. Um, I'll let Jeremiah go into that a little bit more later. Um, but, yeah, everything, we're kind of funneling through them, letting them pay for the print run, and then uh, we're just reimbursing ourselves for the inker and the colorist. And then the penciler, uh, Donovan Peterson, based out of Las Vegas, um, it's not with us today, but um, maybe you can jump on a future podcast. And then myself – Jeremiah, and then we have a letter involved, and then we also have another colorist, Jake, Jake Carter. Yes. Um, and he's been kind of advising right now. He had to take a step back because of some um, family issues that are going on with him, but we wanted to keep the project rolling. So yeah. um, it's been awesome bringing so many people together for you know both a cause and a comic book. Um, and I don't know about you, Brian, but I actually like having – a bigger team to work with because you can bounce yeah. ideas off each other and it's and so if you live in inside of like a small i don't know just doing your own thing is is one thing but when you can kind of breathe the life these characters 
and communicate about them and bounce ideas and brainstorm with other people, especially a larger group. I think it's just funner that way, more fun. That that does lead to a lot to me. I, in my opinion, I think it leads to a lot better ideas. Like I've noticed yeah. that when I get with my friends or my brother at well, my friend is my brother, but whatever. When I get around people that I give a shit about and we all start to talking, the best ideas come from I have this idea that I already would have thought was great. I put it out into the group and the group just adds things and makes it even better than what I would have come up with on my own. Or they force yep. me to poke holes in what I said was going to be cool because they hit me with that logical brain and now I can rethink it. And, and that wouldn't have happened if I was at home by myself. Oh yeah, so true. I just don't know how to quantify that. Like I've always, I've often asked myself as a writer, you know, wanting to write stuff. If I'm in a room and I'm talking with my brother about the idea and we just kind of back and forth and it leads to some greatness. And then I, and I talk to this guy and I have a conversation and he sparks something. When I write my book and I just say special thanks to my brother and special thanks to the other guy, do I even owe them money because they helped come up with like the most popular part of my story? I, I don't, I don't know where to draw the line of, I can't talk to you about this cause I don't want to owe you any money. I guess if you ever become like a, um, Kirkman, I think that you'll you can encounter that when it comes. But <laughs> yeah, but I also yeah, don't want my, I don't want my friends and family to feel like I screwed them over either. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, if it was just a conversation and they didn't ask for anything, are you really screwing them over? <laughs> no, but you kind of, like if you if I'm rolling in my Rolls Royce to my 16 room mansion, and <laughs> okay, well that's a different level though. Well, yeah. <laughs> Okay. How, at this point, I'd just be happy to play all my bills as they come in. Like, if I'm living large, right, that's like, how we yeah, all are, I think. <laughs> I feel like kingpin when all my bills are paid. I just want to sit <laughs> back, relax, and, and light my cigar with a $1 bill. Isn't that yeah. the comic book lifestyle? The comic book creator lifestyle? Oh, I'm sure every yeah. everyone who has a, uh, has a hit story right now, I'm sure Donnie Cates is living the life. Like, he's probably living an okay <laughs> life. You know, his bills are paid, and there's fucking an apartment and eating cheap meals, but... <laughs> Not like the guys that portray them on screen that are eating steak dinners every third meal and being flown to places. <laughs> Not that creator, though. Not yeah, quite. if a good book, a successful book, I think, is one where you break even <laughs> from my own experience and from, from the creators I've talked to in the industry. That is, that is a great jumping off point. If you get in at breaking even, you're doing something right. <laughs> Now, is, are all of you that are involved in the book, have you all met through that Facebook group, the Comic Creators Connection? Uh, not in person, only Joseph and I have met, but that is where all of us got connected, yes. Okay, so that's where you found your letterer, your inker, your colorist, and all the other stuff? Yes, sir. And it's kind of cool, Brian, that, you know, that uh, Jeremiah posted one day about, hey, you know, I got this character, it's about this cause, and I'd like to, you know have it illustrated and then like i jumped on board and i was like hey let's make it a comic and then another guy was like hey i can do the pencils and then another guy was like yeah i'd be happy to do the lettering to see everyone rally especially in the comic book creator community behind a cause like that and want to want to make it bigger than you know maybe what jeremiah had envisioned yeah <laughs> so for better or for worse i don't know if he's regretting the decision now <laughs> um but like you said brian it's been an awesome experience you know throwing an idea out there and you know jeremiah had a concept for the character i'm like well what if this or what if his powers were this and what about the villain is this and then we bounce them through the rest of the guys in the team and then you just the product is so much better now i think market ready than if it's just living in your own head with all you guys yeah, living the... in separate areas how hard is it to get on a conference call where you guys can spitball ideas uh, mostly it's been messaging back and forth through Facebook Messenger and emails and things like that so that everybody can respond as they need to, mm -hmm. um, so that that's not been too much of a problem. We've not had a situation yet where we actually need to be on a conference call and like where it was like mandatory or anything like that. And how do the funds get divvied up? Like when you guys say, we've funded X amount of the book so far, is there like a 50-50 thing or it's I've got this much, you've got that much, that's enough? Um, well, so far it was, it's been mostly, we did a, a, a GoFundMe that helped with a little bit of it. We've sold some advertising that helped with a little bit of it. And then with what our sponsor's throwing in, and it's just all going to get handed right to the printer and the, the, the artists who've had to pay. That's yeah. it. Like, 
That's pretty but, good. Uh, now, how, how far, pocket, it's mostly been me and Joseph. So, how far along? How, when should the uh, comic book expect to be released? Like, when can we, those of us that didn't uh, get on your Indiegogo, how can we get a copy and when? So, so go ahead on that one, Joseph. <laughs> uh, so right now we got uh, it's an eighteen page like one shot kind of all inclusive story. Yeah. Um, we have all the inks done. And pencils, obviously. And then our colorist has about six or seven pages left. And then our letter is going to be done in probably about two weeks. So it's going to go to print in about two to three weeks. Um, our distribution model, it's going to be a free book because what we really want oh, to do right. is raise funds for uh, cystic fibrosis and the um, Colton Underwood's Legacy Foundation uh -huh. so that more people can get treatment, <laughs> uh, more people can get access to these medical devices and so forth. And if it's successful... Um, you know, obviously we want to do an issue two, so on and so forth, but we might have to rethink, you know, because Brian, on your end, if you have to do a free, a free pickup, let alone, you know, 18 pages of sequential artwork, that's a big ask, right? Oh, exactly. I, so, so to get, yeah, go ahead. No, 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 you go ahead, you go ahead. So to get, you know, Donovan, who was gracious enough to give us 18 pages of pencils, um, in his spare time, working around his normal nine to five, you know, everyone's got a nine to five, and then they do the comic book art. Unless yeah. you're very fortunate, and you can do that full time, you know, he's squeezing it in after dinner, staying up late at night, <laughs> hammering out a couple more pencil pages, and so on and so forth. Um, but yeah, he's been awesome. Uh, and then some of our inkers, you know, we kind of had to lock that down by getting a paid <clears throat> someone to, to help out on that end, and then the colorist as well because we want to get the first issue out there, show people what we can do, and then get people excited about, you know, a cause-based book. Because like you said, it's here's the moral of the story. We're delivering the moral of the story, and then this is how it ends. We didn't want to have a book like that. We wanted to have a book that read like a 90s Amazing Spider-Man book. Okay. Now, which are, which are, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, you go ahead, sir. I was going to say, on, the, on that same t uh, same line, and as far as where you start about bouncing ideas back and forth, uh -huh. one of the big things that we're doing is for you know future issues like two, three, however many we do, the ideas of what sh different struggles for CF that we're actually going to have in each comic book is coming specifically from other CF foundation, like CF people, uh -huh. their clinics, things like that. Like we've made it, made it we've made them very aware we want their voices to matter too, it's not just us. All right, now. The the are you going to be distributing this? How, like you said, you're going to just have it for free, and you're looking at your distribution yep. model. Mm -hmm. How do you plan on really getting rid? How many copies do you plan on getting? Let's let's talk that. Uh, the first one we've actually got five thousand. We're having holy um, shoot. Two thousand of those, yeah, two thousand of those is going to the sponsor, and they're handing it out through a program that they're going to be starting in February. Okay, um, that is going to patients and people who you know take care of patients and things like that yeah it'd be part of a package that they send like a care package that means that um, the they've already had got... to they've already had to approve the story and everything right if their name's going to be on Correct. it at that level mm -hmm. okay okay i just i just the only reason oh. i bring that up is just to educate anyone who also may listen to this and has a similar idea i kind of like to put like little notes in the corners like instructions like hey here's what you might need <laughs> for this yeah, now they've already approved our script with whatever edits they, they thought we needed to make. Yeah. They've approved all the artwork, everything like that. Well, that's and cool. the, um, and the uh, budget for the printing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I figured past... that at the, at the uh, sponsorship level that you're think you're talking about, it sounded like they shouldered most of the uh, the print run while you just do most of the story content. Uh, at this point, yes. Um, we like I've been talking to the actual the, the head of them uh, for a while, uh -huh. and depending on how this one goes, the next one it may be them funding all of it, or okay. you know if it doesn't go over well, that could change. It just really depends on how this first one goes. All right. So the model are are, are you going to have like a a your own your own dot com set up so people can order it? Are you going to put it on Amazon, your eBay? Like how are you getting rid of those three thousand copies that you're left with? So initially, uh, we're going to do conventions um, and hopefully talk with the organizers and see if either we can appear and hand out 500 or so at each con or work with the organizers to say the first couple hundred people get a free issue with their paid admission, something like that. And then uh, the idea is just to drive as many people to the foundation as possible because we're not taking any money. Any donations are going to be made directly to the foundation. 
No. And there, uh, there's also a couple of different other CF foundations that are going to be helping me with, like, inviting me to events they're at so we can hand them out. Um, right. On our actual Facebook page for the comic, we've got a couple hundred patients themselves that are asking for copies. Yeah, I, uh, I figured really, you'd have no a lack of people wanting it. <laughs> yeah, but I, I know, but you, at some point you're gonna you're gonna eat a lot of a cost for shipping. Yeah. Like if you did the the webs the eBay and stuff like that, you got to pay those mm-hmm. fees. You got to pay shipping, and it's just really, really. But if you're going to conventions and somebody else is footing your bill to be at that convention. Then that sounds yeah. like a good plan. That like the convention says, yeah, you have a free table, and your sponsor says, yeah, we'll pay for your gas to get there. Then that's a good trip. But yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, because <clears throat> tabling at cons and travel and meals and everything, like you said, that can get expensive. Yeah, well, it can get. <laughs> I I also as an idea, just I uh, I know that there's free comic book day twice a year, and I don't know if you guys have local mm-hmm. comic book shops close to you that you part that you're gonna like like be your home base that on free comic book day if you walk in there with a stack and say can you put mine on the rack with everybody else's i don't think you'd be turned away um i know i know at least me locally i already have five or six comic shops that are willing to do that for us yeah free comic book day is a huge event so, and i mean the, the the idea of free comic book day is introduce your kids that don't know about comic books into comic books like that's kind of yep. what it's supposed to do and that means they may be susceptible to a story like yours where it's not something they have to see in a movie or, you know, with all the Avengers in it. They they can just, hey, let's read this while we're going to the potty or whatever. That's my yeah, grandson. That's a good point. I... In, Hello. The, in the background. <laughs> I think Jer- like E.T. Dad, 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 dad. <laughs> Aw. I think Jeremiah, we're talking more and more about Kickstarter. I don't know your experience with Kickstarter. Um but we were thinking about just asking people to cover the shipping cost, yeah, and then uh, and then sending out the book. You know, have people back for a physical awesome. copy. They can get it for like four or five bucks, and then that just covers shipping, since it's you know a free book anyways. Um, unless we do offer some kind of sketches or whatever for a premium for a premium amount. Have you have you looked into? Have you contacted any other Facebook groups or anybody else that's done a project similar to this to kind of see what they've done, what's worked for them, and what hasn't? Uh, Not people, myself, uh, Jeremiah might. Yeah, so the people I've spoken to that have done similar stuff, none of them have actually done comic books, but they've done, or and the ones they have done have just been like straight up educational, not really fun like ours is. Okay. Um, the- so a lot of what they've done may not work so well for us. <laughs> Well, I do know, let me put this bug in your ear, that I'm a part of a Facebook group called Making Comic Book Collecting Fun Again. And those guys have put together two or three coloring book projects. Now, I know a coloring book and a comic book is different, but they've teamed up with hospitals and stuff to where they put together this coloring book and you can pre-order it or you can order it through uh, private or Kickstarter. And all the funds went to whatever the organization was that they were doing. But the books, the way the Kickstarter thing was working is me as a, as a, as a looker, I buy three spots, three books that they're going to give away. So I'm just pre buying books for them to give away. And then they had a tier where if like you pre bought five books for us to give away, we would send you a book back or something like that. Some sort of model to where it's going to work for you. Have you talked to anybody like that? Uh, not anybody like that, no. Um, I do have the hospital that I actually get treated at, the, the transplant clinic I go to. Uh-huh. Um, I have been talking to them, and they might be willing to help with some of the shipping, um, as well as the actual CF Foundation is going to help with some of the, the more Florida local stuff. Now, when you said you talked to the transplant committee, is that what you said? The transplant clinic that I actually get transplant treated at. Transplant clinic. Yesterday. What part of your body had to be transplanted, or are you waiting on a transplant? Or I, It didn't sound like uh, the ailments I, that you listed would... <laughs> that those need transplants so i didn't didn't know as of now i've not had a transplant um, but most cf patients eventually need lung transplants oh um, because our lungs just eventually will stop working yeah i think i think that's also what uh there's a guy in another group i'm in i think jason tuckness suffers from uh maybe that's what it is because he's he's waiting on a lung transplant 
Now, how, not, how, not a name I know, but there's a lot of people I don't know. So you have, yeah, but on a lung transplant, if you don't mind me digging on that, do, does that mean that you just get one lung from somebody, or do you have to wait for somebody with two healthy lungs to pass away and then get them? Uh, generally, it depends. Unless something happens where one of my lungs is significantly worse than the other, it's uh -huh. almost always a double lung transplant. Okay, which means the person is no longer with us. Right. All right. Well. That's educational. Like, I didn't know if there was, you know, I watch a lot of House, like the old TV show, right? And I thought mm -hmm. I saw, a set, like, I thought they could do, like, a one lung transplant or maybe, like, a, maybe that's liver I'm thinking of. I don't know. I mean, they can, they can do a single lung transplant. Um, but for, for most CF patients, our lungs kind of both go at the same time. Yeah. So it wouldn't really make a lot of sense. But I said, if something did happen, let's say my, my left lung suddenly deflated, or my right's fine. I could get just one lung. Okay. Now, are you are you having to, like, breathe straight oxygen tube, like, all day long? Uh, luckily, I'm not that sick yet. Okay. Um, there have been times where I've had to be on oxygen for a week or two at a time. But for the most part, I'm fairly healthy for a CF patient. All right. Like, is there an age to CF? Like, you know, normally everybody at this age, this is what happened. Normally everybody at this age, this is what happens. Or is it kind of like whenever it surfaces... It, it, or does it uh, surface in everybody at the same time? Well, there's, I mean, well, you're born with it. There, there's oh, no other okay. way to catch it. Um, but there are a couple hundred different mutations of CF. Oh, okay. So it, depending on what mutation you have, yours will, every, it affects you a little bit differently. All right. And then I'm, I'm guessing there's no such thing as like a stomach transplant, is there? Not that I'm aware of. Or it, I guess for yours, it would be more of an intestinal issue. Like mine's an intestinal issue as opposed to a stomach issue. Yeah, mine, um, for us, it's mostly, like, pancreas, liver, like, those parts. Oh, god damn, all the important shit. Yeah. <laughs> not not that any of it isn't important, but there's, uh, there's only one of those. Like, your, your large intestine, you got some feedage. You got some small intestine feedage. You got two kidneys, you know, so that you can give or take, but all that shit you just named, they ain't but one. Yeah, basically. Oh, all right, so... Tell me more about the give, – give, give me a summary of the first story, if you will, of how this – what the adventure is going to – this 18-page adventure in summary. Sell me Go on Go ahead, this. Joseph. You wrote, you wrote it. <laughs> so we really want, he wanted to draw inspiration from McFarlane's Spider-Man run, um, right. especially in Amazing. Which, and then which quick interruption, but McFarlane actually gave a thumbs up to our cover and loved it. <laughs> yeah, that's, oh, is it we a did a homage 300? cover. 298. 298. It was is, 298, right? Is that the one with somebody mm -hmm. shooting with the wings? They're like both flying or floating in the air and fighting each other. Oh, shit. It's the same one he's doing for um, Spawn 298. Okay, okay. Yeah, I got it. All right. So he gave it a thumbs and... up. <laughs> mm -hmm. He loved it. <laughs> so we wanted to do an homage. 300 was been done tons and tons of times. Yeah. Um, 299 maybe and then 298 uh i don't know jeremiah did i ask you which one you wanted to do and i think he picked 298 yeah you gave me a list of five or six and that was my absolute favorite yeah so so you know trying to make this a, a cooperative collaboration kind of thing I'd, i you know sent him a few options and he picked 298 and then we took it to donovan and donovan's like yeah sure so he did it and he signed it you know after mcfarland yeah. with apologies <laughs> <laughs> and uh and then he just, uh, we got it inked, and Jake colored it, and then we uh, made little, do you, Brian, do you remember the uh, Marvel Universe trading cards from the 90s? Oh, hell yeah, dude. So, the little bio <laughs> so like, on the back. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So when we get a chance, we'll have to get you one of these, but we had uh, one of our friends, Dave Lentz, um, he's a designer, mm -hmm. and also a letter and comics, he uh, made it look like uh, Marvel Universe trading cards, so on the front, there's the little you know, the little title, yeah. and then on the back, it has the stats. So uh, we had a lot of fun with that. And those Is that are, like, the one with the little wavy, cards. white, wavy yellow flag in the corner? Yep, so Marvel Universe yeah. 1, that's okay. the <laughs> little wavy flag. And then on the back, the stats we took from uh, the one where, like, the little red and purple bars go across, yeah. and it was, like, 1 through 7. Yeah. Um, but, no, we just wanted to keep that theme. We wanted to make it lighthearted. We didn't want to make this an educational, like, over heavy-handed kind of a deal we just want to make it a light airy fun read so that people can enjoy it and then you know maybe get a couple of these educational elements out of it after the fact 
Well, that's pretty awesome. Now, tell me more about the design. Or, I want to know, is it okay if I talk, uh, if I ask you guys kind of how much it costs you to get to where you're at? Or do you want to avoid financial questions? I think it's fine. Jeremiah, we, can't, I'm, we can't say the exact number of the sponsors kicking in. Um, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm going to talk but... about... I want I, so production costs like yeah like how much like your inkle inker and your penciler were the same person correct so, so originally uh he was supposed to be the same person but because of schedule conflicts and you know trying to get this book out I, I don't know with you but um it always seems like comic projects get extended and then extended yes. especially well, if it's not your full-time gig yeah and at this level where it's like I'm mostly doing this out of charity. Like it, exactly. does, it gets on the back burner of the personal projects and the commissions and stuff like that. I get it. Exactly. But yeah. So, so what was your agreed upon rate with the first guy that didn't make it all the way through? He was supposed to do inks and cut or inks and pencils. So what was so the page rate that he gave you for that? Do you know? So originally when uh, Jeremiah kicked this off, he was uh, just looking for a person to do one image. And okay. then I jumped on board and said, hey, I'm a writer. I will write this for free as a volunteer kind of a thing. And then we had a penciler jump on board and right. say, uh, hey, I'll draw this for free. So basically um, at this point, there's three. you guys are three co-owning this business. Yeah, essentially. Okay, okay. Just All right, so the three of you aren't paying anything. You're going to get... Like, if this ever blows up into some super huge organization, you guys get the best jobs. Exactly. But, all right, so the next guy that you have to pay, the inker. So all he's doing is inking. Yep. Now, what was your agreed-upon inker rate for this guy, and what was that guy's experience level? So I had posted a – we posted a couple posts trying to find someone, and, and you know, I don't know if you've had your own comic, um, but – you go through a few different options and then find a guy that's the right fit, guy or girl that's the right fit for the job. Yeah. Um, so the person we ended up with, his name's Kieran. Um, he's actually from Europe. All right. And I think he's inking around like in the $35 to $45 a page range. Okay. Um, he's doing a phenomenal job. Um, I know that's, you know, anytime you ask for a guy to do something under, you know, 75 or 100 bucks a page, uh, it's a big ask, but he connected with the cause. And, uh, you know, he's doing a phenomenal job. All and then right. the colorist, is not, his name is Pal. Um, he works for Titan. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said that, you know, he was really in tune with the cause. He wanted to see what we could do with it. And I think he's working for half rate okay. um, as opposed to what he'd normally get. So it's cool because we, you know, we didn't necessarily have a few thousand dollars to throw at this that we're not getting paid. You know, it's a project yeah. that we just want to be involved in. And then... If anything in the future happens, you know, that's another another story. Um, now, but, yeah, yeah, so fortunately we've been able to stay in that 35 to $50 a page range for inks and then for colors. All right. And then what about your letterer? Is that just somebody that you know or? He, he jumped on board uh, initially with Jeremiah's post, and he said that he would be willing to work it through and into a schedule um, to letter the like pages a as a volunteer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so – my, the backup was I do letters my own books, um, and I get assists uh, from other letters that have been doing it for longer than I have okay. if I need to. Um, so the backup was I would letter it. All right. And then just, like, submit it to your, your peers and say, hey, did I mess anything up here? Yeah. And, you know, I, I don't know. Do you letter at all, Brian? I've <laughs> – I did three pages of my own work, and people got mad at me because I put a uh, – <laughs> I put a bubble tail crossing over a word in someone else's word balloon, <laughs> and I did that uh -huh. to make it look like somebody was – like he was cutting them off. Yeah. And, you know, like you could partly They're hear like the word come out like, Shoo! and it gets cut off. Yeah. So I put the tail of the other guy's balloon covering the word, and they were like, oh, you can't do that. I was like, no, the, I can do whatever I want because that feels <laughs> like he's kind of like, I'm, my stuff's more important than you. But it was not well received. I don't know that yes. I'm good enough to letter my own stuff. So I'm like right, I'm right on that cusp. Um, I think it's stuff that could be professionally published, but it needs like spruced up, like just as I'm submitting it. So like if an editor had a double take on it or a professional letter, just move things around and make the sound effects a little cleaner. Um, I'm like, I think I'm right there. I'd like to think so. 
So that means that you're serving as your own editor. If you had an editor on board, you'd probably be able to catch that stuff. Uh, we actually have an editor who okay. works for our sponsor. Okay. She's the one who's been doing our editing for us. Yeah, she did our grammar grammar edits on the script. Uh, but she, is she a comic book person? Does she know, you know, no. like page setup and how to that kind of stuff? No, not at all. Okay. <laughs> yeah, this will so, be a first for them. Yeah, and I mean, so you mentioned that you've done comic books before privately outside of this cause comic mm -hmm. right now. How much success have you, I mean, how, like at <laughs> what level of, are you getting, like, are you punish, putting out like a thousand issues a year or tell me more about it. How so, about so 2013, I think is when my original book is called Only Human mm -hmm. um, and we kickstarted 2013, uh, met a local um, artist uh, and Dan was interested in the project so he kind of did the pencils and so on and so forth so that's how we got the first issue out of the gate and then since then is just you know the slow grind of comic book creating um i mean are you it's are you, you know, taking it to conventions are you taking it to shows and put it in your local yeah, comic so book shops with, yeah with that series we were actually in 50 stores across the u.s oh wow um, we had a member of the walking dead lawrence gilliard jr All kind right. of repping our brand um, we, uh, we got talked to about optioning it as a, um, animated series. We had it in, I think about 15 states, including Dragon Con, CT2, Motor City. Like how, uh, we were moving a, a lot of books. How did, how did, like, do you, can you attribute all of that momentum to one thing? Like, is there one thing that like, you know, Tom Cruise tweeted us and I think that's kind of what did it. <laughs> I think it's just that relentless, like, never give up attitude. I think when you take it, I don't know about your experience, but when you table at a con and the fan comes up and you introduce them to, hey, this is my, you know, cover on Metal Shark Bro or whatever, and they see that you're really excited about it, then they kind of feed off that enthusiasm. They're like, yeah, I'll take an issue or two issues or whatever. Um, oh. And also, what else do you do? And you kind of get to pitch them on the other stuff. Um, All right. It's just. I like that. Yeah, it's. it's that momentum, I think that, you know, your own passion plus that momentum. And that was the big thing I learned from my first series was trying to get on a regular release date. Now, um, this is that series complete? We, I think we have two issues to wrap that first story arc up. Um, but I got sidelined, not sidelined, but I had four projects kind of uh, crop up simultaneously. Pathways, one of them. We have uh, <laughs> one that we're talking to Arctic uh, Press about. Ah, um, Antarctic one that Press, I yes. Think is Antarctic Press, yeah. And then one that uh, we're working with, um, Action Lab. All right, yeah, I'm familiar with and them. And then an another one that we're soliciting, and then a personal project, which is a 128-page graphic novel that I'm getting ready to launch a Kickstarter on. Wow, you're kicking much ass, sir. So you are doing Try, all just kinds of get, stuff. Just trying to get them out the door. Yeah, I think well, I've been in and You're establishing yourself as a writer, so... Spread your seed yeah. as far as you can until someone says, hey, would you like to write the next Venom story arc? True. Yeah, I think I've been in production purgatory for the last probably year and a half. <laughs> now, have you been in comic books? Have you done anything else in comic books prior to, to, the, to this one? I have not. This is my first one. So when you came up with the character, you just want, you were just creating a comic book character, you thought? Oh, originally, I wasn't going to be a comic book character. It would just be a cosplay character that I would put on informational things. Ah. And it just kind of exploded so the, from there. So. The cosplay was to get your attention at a convention and things that you do. And then when they mm -hmm. come up and say, what are you supposed to be? You say, hey, I am, and here's my story. Exactly. And then so you, you disseminate the education, you know, a slight education, introduce them to what you're doing. I like that. So the cosplay turned into... Hey, let me draw that for a comic because I think that's a cool story to tell. That's pretty awesome, guys. Yeah, so, I got to uh, wear, the, wear the costume and hand out about a thousand of those uh, playing cards you were talking <laughs> about, the collectible cards. Yeah, at cards. A, uh, Yeah, an event here in Tampa, uh, what, like three, four months ago. It was a Great Strides Walk with the CF Foundation, which okay. is like, they're, like all over the world. And there was five, six thousand people there who were taking pictures of me, um, one of the news channels. Oh, that's badass. Doing a story on it. And, yeah. So, Brian, badass. we 
kind of kicked this off in what March, Jeremiah. Oh, right about um, then, yeah. And we are hoping to get in time for Tampa Bay Comic Con. I think that was in August. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, production got pushed back a little bit, so uh, you know, it's looking like September now. So, um, so what's going to be like be like the huge debut event? Like when is <laughs> we were Megacon? Hoping that, <laughs> yeah, we were hoping that the sponsor would be like, "Yeah, we'll fly all you guys to one show Shit. and give you like a backdrop banner, and then uh, have everyone take pictures with Jeremiah, have the entire creative team sign each copy, you know, and educate people there at the show." We were hoping like New York or something. Yeah. Um, but wishful thinking for now, until yeah. you know maybe something else happens with it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, honestly, right they... now the. the... I was like, as of right now, the biggest one we could possibly get into is until January, and that's uh, here in Florida. So, what's the name of that one? Honestly, I don't even remember off the top of my head. I have it written down, and it's in an email where I was talking to him. But I gotta talk to him again in November about reserving the table. So, when's yeah. MegaCon, Brian? That's in I, April. I, I'm not real sure. See, I'm I'm in Atlanta, so I just did DragonCon like last weekend. So I know that DragonCon is Labor Day weekend. I know HeroesCon is Father's Day weekend. Everything else I kind of just kind of don't remember. <laughs> I gotcha. And I think yeah. San Diego is uh, in July. SD yeah, the San Diego Comic-Con I think is in July. Yep. Yep. Yeah, MegCon. I'm sorry. MegCon's in May. Oh, okay. But that's a, that's a, that's a huge – but there's a, there's a huge one that is in Washington State. What is that, Emerald awesome City? AwesomeCon. Maybe it's Awesome oh. Con. Sorry, uh -huh. Awesome Awesome Con's DC. Um, yeah, Emerald Emerald City. Yeah, that, that's a big one. I mean, you guys know the big ones, man. So if you could, yeah. they, if you could just roll that out, that'd be the shit. But I don't know that that'd be easy to do. So we got our penciler in Las Vegas, and then Jeremiah is down in Florida, and I'm in Ohio. Um, so we just need one that you know we can basically fly two of the other guys to. Oh, okay, yeah. Well, there's also, I think there's a huge one in Vegas as well. Yep. I can't remember the name of it. I can't, dang, I can't remember the name of that. Well, dude, that's, I'm glad to see, what are you guys, what are you guys buying? Are you guys still reading comic books? <laughs> oh, absolutely. I, <laughs> I just re-picked up the hobby when I started going to Comic-Cons again about seven or eight years ago. I had like a 15 or 10 or 15 year hiatus when I was too cool for comics, I guess. Ah. Um, and then got a little cousin back into, or got a little cousin into the comic book kind of comic con thing. And then I was like, Oh, I actually kind of still like this stuff. So that's <laughs> when I reignited my passion. All right. What were some of the ti What are some of your favorite titles? Uh, Jeremiah, sure. you want to take this first? I collect Green Lantern. All right. So you're a DC guy uh, overall, you think? No, I like Marvel better. I just like Green Lantern better okay. than anything else. <laughs> All right, give me some of the Marvel titles, because I, I don't really read DC, but give me some of the Marvel titles. Uh, my preferred Marvel titles? Yeah, um, like if you go into the store. Probably all of them, of, of all of Marvel, is my favorite would be Venom. All right, you like the new Donny Kate stuff? I, I do. I also like the, the whole Agent Venom arc they did, too. Yes, that was uh, Flash Thompson, right? Correct. Yeah, I did, and he was in the Guardians of the Galaxy and stuff. I guess they retconned all that, huh? Probably. They, change, they like to change things a lot. So, are you reading the Absolute Carnage stuff that's going on right now? Uh, I'm picking it up actually this weekend, tomorrow. All right. Well, let me try to find another topic. Hey, what did you think about <laughs> the Venom movie? Honestly, I loved it. Now, all right, you loved it unabashedly. No, no asterisks. You loved it. I mean, they definitely could have done some things better lore wise, like story wise, but I have, don't really have any giant complaints about the movie. All right, and how about you? Are we allowed to mention other like uh, YouTubers or anything on here? Oh, I don't care what you Is do, man. Different? <laughs> so, Comic Tom. Um, he's a YouTuber that covers oh, yes. comic book news and stuff like that. My, Are you familiar? My Scout Comics. Uh, guys I work for, they have recently partnered up with Comic Tom. Oh, cool! To do a subscription um, box and giving uh, covers away, like exclusive covers. Oh, that's awesome! His his content's pretty cool. I just stumbled on it the other night because I was looking up uh, CGC or CSS pressing questions, uh -huh. and he does like a top ten hot comics every week or whatever. Yeah. And his co-host, um, I'm not sure who he is, um, but I think he's a comic shop owner. 
and they were talking about how Will Smith bombed in Suicide Squad. Yeah. And how Will Smith didn't want anything to do with any more, uh, I don't know, DC or Suicide Squad movies or something. That's fine. And when the movie came out, I had, I was like, mixed emotions. I wasn't really excited about it. And all my other friends were like, oh, dude, you're stupid. Suicide Squad was awesome. They made me feel bad about not liking uh... the movie. So then I didn't share, <laughs> share my opinion. And the same thing with Venom. Like, you know, I appreciate everyone's opinion. It was awesome to see any comic book character come to life on the silver screen. So for that, I'm excited. But when you're so... I don't know, invested in wanting these things to be as good as possible. There's just some things that missed for me personally. And they mentioned that on Comic Tom. So I was like, okay, good. I'm not the only person that wasn't completely in love with that movie. Can we at least agree that it was better than the Spider-Man 3 version of Venom? <laughs> yes, That's true. that version of Venom, but the movie not so much. So here, here's my take on this, right? The writing for the dialogue in this movie is terrible. Yeah. The, uh, the overall story of the movie is not good. The actors okay. outside of Eddie Brock are not good. The only thing that is good is watching Tom Hardy and Venom on screen together. That was so <laughs> awesome to see the Venom stuff, the Eddie Brock stuff, the duality, but everything else in that movie was like a turd in the wind. <laughs> well, generally, when I try to watch, when I watch superhero or, or comic movies, I watch them as if nothing else in that entire universe exists other than that movie. Because otherwise, I'll sit there and just compare it to like the source material constantly, and then I can't enjoy it at all. Yeah, because my... you know they're going to change things every see, single time. And see, I don't have that yeah. same hookup or hiccup, hiccup because I'm just want <laughs> I want my dialogue to sound like real people talking. I want the yep. characters on screen to react to whatever the fucking situation is like real people <laughs> would like, don't be like, you know what I'm saying? Like, so that's what I look for when I watch a movie, I can watch a movie like John wick and still say that's a great a movie, even though half that shit is garbage and it's not going to work <laughs> a bulletproof jacket. But what I'm saying is if that were to exist, everybody is acting, it's acting properly. You know what I mean? I can watch a Fast and the Furious and a Calvin and Hobbes or Hobbs and Shaw. I can watch those movies and realize that it's completely fake and garbage, but at least they're reacting correctly for that environment. True. So that's so what Brian, I look I have, for in a movie. I have two questions for you because you podcast a lot. And, well, I, I um, podcast a lot. No one listens, but I do it pretty regularly. <laughs> so... Do you, I mean, because there's all these, like, politically correctness things out there, oh, and God. being a writer, I don't want someone to be like, oh, dude, I'm not going to read your book because you didn't like the movie Venom. I, I'm always afraid to put my opinions out there, <laughs> so I don't know if, how you handle it personally, um, being a creator yourself and someone, like, wanting to pick it in your book because you have an opinion on something. Yeah. All right, so all cards on the table. I am trying to create a Brian Silverback's brand. Like, I want people to like me for what I do, for the way that I talk, yeah. for the way everything about my this person, I want them to enjoy and identify yeah. with. So I try to, I, I keep, I do my very best to keep everything as real and honest as possible, so that you don't like me for one thing that I'm fake about and find out that I'm a different way when you're not, you know. I'm just who I am. If you want to be friends, that's cool. We can fucking be friends. We don't have to be, yeah. but that's fine. So I try not to hide anything. But she I just put it out there, and if they like it, they like it. If not, then yes. Because what I do is I want customers, and I say customers, which is not exactly how I feel. I want people to back what I'm doing because of who yeah. I am, what I stand for, and how I did it. So you, let's say let's say I draw really great pictures. I draw your favorite character the best you've ever seen it and you've got him on my wall i also want you to listen to my podcast you know what i mean i yeah. want you to check out this next movie that i'm in i want you to check out the next thing that i'm doing because i want you to not to having one thing that you really like is a bonus but you're like oh shit all this other cool stuff i'm being exposed to i really appreciate that and i don't want to so i don't want to i don't want to mislead anybody and say you know what Venom was awesome. I need all you guys to go to Venom. You know, Brian likes Venom dot com and give me a thumbs up and like, share, subscribe, and buy my next three albums. You know, I don't want to do that. 
If I if I legitimately I want people to trust me to I believe that guy. So if I ever had the opportunity to say this this uh this white tip marker is the best marker I've ever had, I want the people to believe me because they know that I'm not going to feed them a line of shit because I was yeah. told that hey, here's some white markers, here's a $100. Remember, these are the best markers you've ever had. I don't want that. Gotcha. So, yeah, so I guess that's one small advantage for the fact that I this is my first time making a comic book or anything. Is <laughs> I'm not a writer, I'm not an artist, so I can watch movies and not look at it like a writer or an artist. I just look at it going, is this enjoyable? <laughs> that's really it. Yeah, and then how can I how can I make a character with some of these traits that I've seen that I like from character A, character B? Like, right. There's always fun ways as a creative person to be like, you know what? I like the way he approached his a, a critical situation. Next time I write a character I'm going to create, I'm going to use that type of, you know, use that as a reference, but I like the way that he wined and dined. And so it's really cool where you can pick little pieces up creatively and, and like weave them into something that's your own and then almost lose the fact of where, where the original inspiration came from. Yeah. Well, that's like, with, like the pathway, he, he moves like Spider-Man, but he's got nanotech, like, like a uh, Iron Man. But he also has a shield that he can mind control like Spawn's cape. I mean, <laughs> but what is his weakness? <laughs> I mean, the fact that he's terminally ill. He, so that's the, the only way everybody else's CF is. Like, if he gets like so, somebody did over, you know, bring way too much smoke on, he starts coughing. He's screwed. Oh, I mean, I mean he, is that the way you've presented this character? That if he ran into Sir Smokes he, a lot, that he he might be down for the count. <laughs> well, we we put we pre- we pre- basically the way we're working him is he has. Anything that normal CF people would be affected by, he is too. All right. Um, but the way we're handling the book is while he's doing all the fighting, he almost never wins on his own. It's always like, you know, some a patient or a nurse sees him getting, you know, starting to lose and gets inspired to help him out. Okay. Now, so, the way want, that you way that you've described that, see them like that. It, is this more of a like ages ten and under kind of book? Um. I mean, it's definitely appropriate for more of all ages. Like, it, like there is the fighting and all that. We just we're very much keeping it where there's no hypersexualized characters. Well, not, yeah. There's not needless blood and gore, nothing like They're that. They're dropping f bombs. So very much <laughs> all appro- all age appropriate, <laughs> not just adults or just kids. We all wanted right. to capture well, it, the same audience as like a '90s Amazing Spider-Man. Right. All right, the Amazing Spider-Man, but I mean that was Carnage and Venom, dude. I don't know what year, what '90s Spider-Man lighthearted stuff you're talking about, but it's was... not all going to be lighthearted. But if you remember, <laughs> even the stuff with Venom wasn't overly bloody. They didn't show like people just ripped apart for no reason. No, like, guts hanging like, out of his head. Stuff. No, but yeah, I'm talking right. about like so the story content. Kind of stuff. The story content was a little deeper than than what it sounds like um, you're presenting. And some of ours will definitely be fairly dark, like. Um, I mean, not to give too much away, but the one we're talking about for the second one is him dealing with a lot of depression and people wanting to hurt themselves because of being sick and things like that. Oh, like wow. that one's going to be a lot darker than the first one is, but Fuck, yeah, that's going to be a kind of overall tone to it. That I would be, I, I'd almost be pissed if you just sold me that the nurse comes out and helps him in the first <laughs> issue. And now the damn, the guy's <laughs> damn near ready to hang himself because his legs open because he's, because he's dealing with depression. Like that's a complete... 180, uh, sir. No, 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 it'll be more of like him trying to help other patients who are suffering from a horrible depression because oh. of a bad guy who's doing it to them. Okay, but that it still well, sounds it's... like that is a hell of a <laughs> that is a hell of a jump from one to two. No, it, it, it may, when you actually read it, it'll make complete sense, promise. Wow, we. So tell me more about his uniform. What's like, like what what color scheme are we going with here? Black and purple. All right. So is he? Um, you know, Iron Man has the core that powers him. Yes. So that's it's kind of a little bit inspiration that we drew. He's got this like nanotechnology that's powered by this like core that's kind of near his chest. It's not right. implanted into him, but it's like part of his outfit. All right. And it can yeah, manipulate it's a... itself like a Spawn's cape, and then also the whole the um, whole suit. So is it spandex yeah. or is it armor? Or is it just nanobots holding hands? It's like, yeah, nanobots holding hands. <laughs> yeah, it, look, it looks more cloth when you're looking at it. All right. And then when... Does he wear a cup? When the tentacles... <laughs> Does he wear a what? Does he wear a cup? 
<laughs> I don't think he gets punched in the crotch in the first. Yeah, issue. but you got to keep it smooth. Uh, if the nanobots, remember. if they're just nanobots <laughs> holding hands, that means we're gonna see free Willy and everything. <laughs> Unless they somehow like say, you know, let's make this little area raised here. Is this Batman well, damned? <laughs> well, you play Mortal Kombat, right, Brian? Yes, I love Mortal. Right, Kombat. Think, think like the uh, like the original Scorpion and Sub Zero costumes, where it's got like that tabard over his pants. Ah, okay. The costume kind of resembles that. All right, so kind of like, like a Viking pirate kind of Assassin's Creed robes and stuff, like where they drape over the belts, and yeah, they have kind of like that. They have like a little symbol in the middle. Yeah, I mean, he doesn't have a little symbol in the middle. His is actually uh, his symbol is worn as a little shield on his left arm. It's, it looks like a big purple ribbon. Uh, oh, like the, the 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 medical ribbons, the don't forget ribbons, that kind of thing. Right, because the one for CF is a purple ribbon. Okay. So we will incorporate that incorporated that into his costume without trying to make it like I thought purple. You know, hey, this is what it is. I thought purple was fibromyalgia. Like, uh, uh, that's, light, may... per, that's like a real light purple. Ours is like a real dark, almost midnight purple. Midnight purple? I've never heard of that color before. Like it's a darker purple, <laughs> yeah. I've heard of midnight blue, and I'm a purple connoisseur. Like, I've always loved purple. <laughs> like, per, yeah, I've loved like purple that, that so purple much. If you turn the lights off, you can't see it anymore because it's so dark. <laughs> well, I think that's any purple, sir. <laughs> Even hot pink purple goes off when I turn the lights off. Ah, you know what I mean, though. <laughs> but yeah, so I'm, I've never heard Midnight Purple. I'm gonna have to start. I'm gonna have to start using that one. I mean, that that may not Your be your favorite color. It. I don't know. It's just a real dark purple. <laughs> what did you guys think of that Hellboy movie that just came out? Did I didn't watch it, Jeremiah? Did you watch it? There's a turd. I did. I watched it. I, I heard I it was did a bust. Not love it, but a lot of that was it wasn't Ron Perlman. <laughs> No, a lot yeah. of that was it was written. Did. It was nowhere near as good as the first the first one. Ah, the writing not even was the same terrible. Ballpark. So, terrible writing. Brian, what kills a movie for you? Is it is it dialogue? Is it campy acting? Is it people just reading the script and not putting in any kind of like? I wish I could narrow player? it down. I'm all, all those about things. it's first off the dialogue has to sound real, then yeah. maybe a little acting after that. Like you have to have a little <laughs> bit of acting, like that. That that that'll kill me. Any the dialogue or the situation is just so absurd in a movie where that is not what's going to happen. You know, if I'm watching Austin Powers and the guy, you know, has 18 throws before the hand grenade blows up, I get it. But if I'm watching a like some sort of World War II shit and the guys are picking up grenades and throwing them back and forth five or six times before it blows up, I I, I immediately do not like watching that movie anymore. Yeah. Because everything so you, has a you place. Don't see a movie that takes, you don't want to see a movie that takes place in the 1800s and the guys are talking about hanging out? I, I, you know what? If I knew more about it, like I don't know if they said, you know, Game of Thrones and, and that fake time. I don't know if they would have said all those cuss words. Like those cuss words they use felt kind of modern. To like, It's like when I was watching, you know, the, the uh, uh, Quentin Tarantino movies when he's doing like an old 1800 Westerns and he's like, motherfucker. And I'm like... I, that sounds to me like it's a new cuss word. It, it shouldn't be around in those times, which, yeah, so dialogue Agreed. does a lot for me. That is that's yeah, probably the you. main thing. I A lot of times, I don't know, recently, am I allowed to mention... You do whatever uh, you want. <laughs> the Big D. <laughs> what, oh, my and gosh. They're, and they're, the Big D. And the recre... <laughs> Goddamn, sir, I didn't know you saw me naked, but go ahead. No. <laughs> Uh, the the um, the movie production company. Oh, Disney. <laughs> um, <laughs> the recent remakes I've been making. Oh it's my just, God. I want to love the movies, but it, it feels like the characters are just reading scripts with like no added flair or artistic expression. I don't give two squirts of urine about any of those movies, man. Those <laughs> just look so bad because you already did it right the first time. Beauty and yeah. the Beast, you did it right. Lion King, yeah. you did it right. Like, start creating some new shit. <laughs> Disney, if you take them apart, is a creativeless turd nugget. That they 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 haven't created. Disney itself hasn't done anything new. They're just buying up people that are. Like once, I, mean, what's I don't know about last, you guys, but what's the last Disney ahead. movie? What's the last Disney movie that was any good? That was Disney, not Star Wars or Marvel. But what's the last Disney movie that you can remember 
that you were like, dude, that was fucking awesome? As as a whole, none. I did like just Will Smith and the new Aladdin, though. Everything else sucked, but I liked his part at least. Are yeah. we talking like Pixar? Uh, I think Pixar. I'd like to not include Pixar because Pixar was their own thing that got also bought up by the the the, the okay. machine that is Disney. <laughs> It's tough to say, and I was just thinking about this the other day. I said, you know, all of the recent releases that have been big blockbusters for Disney have all been basically Marvel movies, right? Well, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's like, what what would... And then Star Star Wars, Wars. obviously. So what would they have been making movies of if they didn't buy Lucasfilms and if they didn't buy Marvel? (laughs) uh, We got Lady and the Tramp. We've got every... Like, the Aristocats are coming... We've already got, like, there's so much. They're just going to go back to their old library and make every one of them. We're going to have Fantasia, you know, fucking 3D, whatever. Like, it's terrible. They're not giving new, they're not making anything new. The yeah. mouse yeah, is they falling they apart. To. There's a sad part. Like, what are the, like, it, it, you go to Disney World and it's not even really, it's like, who gives a fuck about Disney. I want to ride the Marvel rides and I want to ride the Star Wars rides. I don't give a shit about riding your teacups or flying around in Dumbo. Like, no one's going for <laughs> that. They're, 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 we got this new Harry Potter attraction. No one, Disney has nothing of their own. And I think that they need to start doing some damn mouse shit. <laughs> I can agree to and, that. I don't know. I mean, you're a scout, right, Brian? Yeah. And, and, I think in a previous podcast, you were talking about how Scout doesn't, like, do the superhero thing. They want to kind of, like, they explore their own that, that, genre. Yeah, they, because they, 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 the, the superhero market is full Saturated. up. Saturated. You're not going to compete so, with Spider-Man. You're not going to compete with Batman. Exactly. So it's like, it's kind of the, as a independent creator um, and not working with the big guys, um, it's kind of that, hey, you know, we want to put out this new character that's not been done before, but then the audience is kind of cold to receive it yes. because they only want to see more Spider-Man and Iron Man and stuff like that. So it's really a catch-22 for an independent creator because we want to put out that brand new character that no one's ever seen before, but they kind of only want the stuff that's already uh, been done a hundred times. I know, so. and the movies aren't helping that because I'm right. Scout has a title right now called Star Bastard, which is... Uh, kind of like a Guardians of the Galaxy. Uh, it's a small crew in space where one of the guys is like a uh, like a Lone Star from Spaceballs. Kind of R-rated. You know, he's down to have sex. He's down to do all this other stuff and owe people money. It's it's basically like if Han Solo was in charge of the Guardians of the Galaxy. Like that's kind of or or Kenny Powers. It's like Kenny Powers is the leader of the guardians of the galaxy. And that's a great story. Like that's fun, but are you willing to go to the store? And when you see star Lord and you see this other copy of star bastard, most of the people are going to say, I like Chris Pratt in the movie and he had the raccoon. Yep. So it's, (laughs) and it's the other thing is how many times, how many times do you see a captain America shirt or a Spider-Man shirt? Like, Oh dude, I love the comic. And they're like, what comic? I like the movie. It's like, uh, yeah, I you guys see, not know. I see Donnie Cates tweets time to time about people getting riled up about movie stuff. Like just recently they're like, oh, well, Marvel doesn't sign the deal with Sony. So Spider-Man's leaving the MCU. And then Donnie Cates mm-hmm. will tweet and say, if there was only a place where Spider-Man still played with Iron Man and all the rest of the <laughs> Avengers, if only such a place existed. Yeah, I saw that one. But, I mean, he's done it several times when people start crying about, oh, this movie universe, this movie universe, blah, blah, blah. But uh, what I really want to know is what is your thought on Venom 2? All right. It's a brain teaser. Anybody. Um, Someone likes Venom. (laughs) Now, do you know who the director is? I do not. All right. Andy Serkis is the director. Does that not ring any bells for you? It, it does. Um, honestly, my whole thoughts about Venom 2 or a Carnage movie in general would be, at the end of the first one, you remember how they teased Carnage yes. in there? And it was fucking Jim Carrey? No. It, wasn't, it was Woody Just, Harrelson. No. But... <laughs> was it? Could yeah. Swore it was Jim Carrey. Or that was no. a meme I saw, maybe. I it remember. was Woody Harrelson. Woody Harrelson, right? Whoever I saw, whoever it was, I just went, no. 
<laughs> yeah, the wig like kind of made it bad. Yeah. The wig is what the wig is the only thing that killed that moment for me because Woody Harrelson is the jam. Oh, I yeah. love him. And I just think it was that horrible fucking red curly wig that made him look like Ronald McDonald. <laughs> but so the next movie is going to be Carnage or it's going to have Carnage in it. It is going to be directed by Andy Serkis. Those are things that are going to happen along with Venom. Is it going to be Woody Harrelson? Yes. Huh. And uh, now what do you think the odds are that Sony and Marvel have said, you know, peace out to each other, uh, that maybe in the end of like a little punctuation mark at the end of uh, the second movie, maybe Spider-Man actually makes it into a Venom movie. I'd be cool with that. Now, how likely do you think it is, though? Like zero. Oh, really? <laughs> Poop. <laughs> no, because I th- I think Disney will try to shut that down, and they'll just keep going in- until they own everything. No, what so. I I heard they got the final fu button today. Like some, I thought that I read something that said again. Sony says final. You know, throws the gauntlet down. No, it puts into the rumors. But all right, so let's say it is the case. You know, Sony doesn't want to give up X amount of million dollars. That means that Sony now has sole custody of their bastard child, Spider-Man, and they've already taken him to the hospital twice. (laughs) This is his third time coming from the hospital. Sony has to say, we've messed this up. So what can they do except maybe throw him in a movie that already made over a million dollars on its own and combine the franchises of Venom and Spider-Man? I mean, if they do it correctly, it definitely could do the job. Well, the odds of Sony but, pulling that off are slim. Yeah, that's the problem. Yeah. Yeah. Look at the look at the previous Spider-Man movies. Well, I liked the Andrew Garfield movie, the first one. But how did they do at the box office, and how was it received by I think fans as a whole? I think both of them were received very well. I mean, the before the first Spider-Man. There wasn't a whole lot of oversaturation with super book or comic book movies, mm-hmm. so it it did very well. The second one had to had to uh, appease all the fans that were fans of the first three, and that's where it fell short. Was those guys didn't like it because it wasn't their Spider Man, mm-hmm. but it was still a good Spider Man. I like Andrew Garfield. Now, do you think that do you think Spider Man? Homecoming in those movies would be what they were if they didn't have the Avengers tie in. No. And by Marvel no and, means and and right because they didn't want to uh, i don't know without iron man how does he get the suit he's still he's gonna have to do the whole nerd shit where he's got to go yeah. fight a wrestler and then uncle ben like he's gonna have to do that because he has no millionaire who's gonna drop money in his lap unless you completely tell a different story and like replace the tony stark role with like norman osborne kind of grooming him and then he's the one that gives mm-hmm. him the tech and then, you know, turns his back on him. Like, you'd have to retell that. And the fans are going to hate that shit, too. That's true. I really don't think about how integral, you know, the Avengers and everything became in uh, Amazing Spider-Man lore. So they're kind of, I don't know, almost like you said, they're kind of cut off. Yeah, did you guys see that X-Men movie? a lot of stuff they can do. Dark Phoenix? <laughs> yes. Phoenix? Yeah. Yeah. Did you- Unfortunately, yeah, I saw it. Did anyone like it? <laughs> no, not even a little. They tried to put. They tried to do too much. And well, Apocalypse it, too, right? Yeah. The la- the last one. I just I think there would have been different movies if if the big D was at the helm. I do think so as well, but I don't think we would have nearly got as much cool shit as we got in the first trilogy. And you know yeah. the the first X Men First Class, like those those were good movies. Days of Future Past, we would have never got that. Yeah. It just sucks. But, I mean, we can't do anything. We probably also wouldn't have got Deadpool, for sure. We would have got no Wolverine Origins. That was terrible. <laughs> we would have got the first Deadpool either way. No. We just wouldn't have got the second one, that's all. I don't think we would have got the first one. If Disney was owning them at the time... <laughs> Disney wouldn't. Oh, if, he owned, if they owned him, no. Yeah. yeah, Disney would have never entertained the idea of having a superhero telling all the f bombs and stuff. So you think that Fo- or whoever got pushed that way because 
they really had to explore something that Disney couldn't with the rest of the MCU. Oh, no, no, no. Marvel has so- sold the rights to Spider-Man like in the like early 2000s or late 90s because they were yeah. going bankrupt. And yep. so that's when we got those Spider-Man movies and they just they were going to keep doing it and keep cashing that check and never have to give the rights back. So but do you think that they went that way with the darker like the Deadpool, the R-rated superhero flicks because that was like their I don't know. That that, that was, was something signature. we can't do. That's I mean, yeah. maybe it was like a, a nanny boo boo to Disney saying, "You guys yeah. are too afraid to do this shit. We're going to give the people what they want." That's almost how I feel. Yeah. Uh, maybe uh, that's what it is. Now, neither of you guys see Brightburn. I have seen I Brightburn. I like Brightburn. What did you think of that one? It inspired a new uh, uh, book that I want to write. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for dude, better, I think it's worse. crazy. Like, I mean, what's cool is that we already know before we even watch the movie, that it's basically Spider-Man or, uh, Superman, but as a bad kid. And then we just watch mm-hmm. to see how far it's going to go. So that was cool to already have that in your head. And then the way the movie ends, you're like, well, dang, man, let's let's see where this goes. So I, they, I, I, like I, they hinted at a whole other thing, which would be a, like they even gave, like the guys who wrote it gave that movie a, a entire new genre. Like they actually named it and everything. What was it, it called? Was great. Uh, they called it Dark Heroes. Dark Heroes. It's literally like the, the superheroes we know. Like in the, like in Brightburn, he was a little kid who got bullied, then found out he was indestructible. Think about real life. If you were bullied and then found out you couldn't get hurt, that's probably what you would do. It's called payback. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's kind of how they're, that's the whole genre they went with is, well, what if these superheroes didn't decide to do the good thing? Yeah, I'd like to see if if this were the case – I like it to be like a Black Mirror situation where we do Bright Burn. That's basically Superman gone bad. And then it, we left mm-hmm. it open for a sequel, but we're not going to do it. Our next movie is going to be Wolverine. What if he grew up and he was bad? And then our next movie will be Cyclops. What if Cyclops grew up? Like they just pick superhero uh, tropes and then just like tell that story differently. So there's not true sequels, but more of more information in the same universe like like a what if style story yeah. i think would be cool well here's one for you what about the boys oh dude i okay let's talk about i heard you guys chant about that last podcast the i had no idea what the boys was i just was familiar with the name garth enos enos from the preacher and all of his work on the punisher and stuff so I was like, let's watch this. I knew within the first 15 minutes of watching the first episode, I was like, this is going to be badass. And <laughs> I never, never a dull moment. I really enjoyed all the episodes of the first season. And I can't wait for more. I loved how they made it very obvious who each hero was supposed to be in like <laughs> comic book world. <laughs> yeah. That was, uh, dude, it, I cannot express enough how fun that was to watch as, like, here's the dark side of the superhero life that you don't get seen in Marvel movies. So I thought that was really, really cool. And then to have that whole, uh, the whole, like, true detective kind of feel to it, like they're putting together a story and spying on people. So I, I really enjoyed that a lot. Yeah. It's probably one of the most one of the shows I've enjoyed the most in recent history. Yeah, what are you looking forward to next? What what's your next movie you're looking forward to? Honestly, I don't know. I haven't really had time to pay attention to much of anything lately. I've been dealing with a lot of health stuff. So. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I've been waiting for Gambit. <laughs> I keep, guess that's not happening. Keep waiting, sir. <laughs> I keep know. waiting. Channing Tatum is is all geared up, but he's got nowhere to go. That was my uh, that was my favorite character as a kid. So what did you think about when you watched uh, Wolverine Origins? Like, did you like that rendition of Gambit? I, it was it was a rendition of Gambit, Gambit. So I guess anyone was better than none, right? Yeah, but I mean, it wasn't terrible, right? Like, I, it was kind of cool. Yeah, I thought so. I mean, expect, you know, the introduction when he's in the little casino part or whatever, in the little brothel, and he's doing his flips and his bow staff, and but then at the end of the movie, they didn't really keep true to the character, so to speak. So. 
And what's a ro- what, what's a Gambit movie without Rogue? You know, so maybe they do need their own story. It's true. Oh, yeah, they just released that what Gambit Rogue miniseries Marvel did last year. Yeah, Mister and Mrs. Something or other X, Mister and Mrs. X. I think I forget what it was called. All right, now before we close this out, I got one thought or one. I want to ask you a couple of things in the comic book world. Sure. All right, <laughs> who do you cast as She Hulk? And who do you mm. cast as Moon Knight? Because mm. you know they both got announced for shows on the Disney Plus yeah. streaming thing. Are we allowed to take uh, wrestlers? Yeah, do you think they'll be a good Saturday. actor? <laughs> That's tough. Because Ronda Rousey's terrible as an actress. <laughs> how much? How much does She Hulk like dialogue though? A she's lot? a lawyer. Yeah, she's they're gonna smart. be they're gonna be doing all sorts of court scenes and stuff. Like she's gonna be giving dissertations, so she has to be able to speak. <laughs> no Ronda Rousey. Huh. No Natalia. <laughs> no, I can't think of any female wrestlers that are wrestling now that I can think of. Like no one fits I what I want. There's for She-Hulk. one because. I, I don't watch wrestling, but a friend of mine showed me a, a clip of some female wrestler not long ago. It would actually work. Yeah. It's because she's a she's not a size zero like most female wrestlers. She's a little bit bigger than a girl, but she's actually like muscular and tall, like like she Hulk. What color she, hair does she have? I think her hair was. I want to say it was like a brunette. Uh, I don't I really know. I wish I could remember her name right now, but I don't watch wrestling. So China, China would have been a good pick, but those days are gone. Yeah, I remember when she was circulating as the main She-Hulk pick for a while. That would be good. But I, I wonder if they're going to do like they do with the Ruffalo and then just kind of pick an actress and use her face and still just have everything really be CG. Or are they just going to go like Lou Ferrigno and just gr- put green paint all over her? Oh, God, I hope not. You don't think that Paige would be a good pick? Paige, no. Well, she's got the, that the accent. That was in that f- I don't think she's going to be able to off the acting part well i don't think Paige can switch that accent and she's gonna unless they retell the type of story because she hulk is supposed to be the cousin of bruce banner so i doubt she's gonna have that kind of accent on her but she's not near yeah. like she hulk has to be like damn near seven foot or six like six and a half feet tall so that reminds me of cable versus uh thanos right yeah Josh Brolin. It was it was Cable. He looked Cable's supposed to be like as tall as Thanos, right? Like six ten mm-hmm. or something like that. But he looked like he was a little shrimp in Deadpool he, two. He did. They yeah. And then Thanos, he looked like he was like nine foot, nine foot, you know, god or something. Well, I like the Thanos. I like both of the characters that I was presented. By the way, I like both of the Josh Brolin characters. Yeah. Now, now five years ago, you know who would have worked great as She Hulk, but I don't know that it would work anymore. Who's Lucy Lawless? Oh wow, yeah, she's definitely not as t- it's. She's not in the physical prime like she used to be. You know what I mean? Right. But that but would like, have been like, a good like call five, ten years ago. Yeah. But now I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I guess we'll have. I think I think they're gonna have to go unknown, or uh, they'll just have to go uh, CG and just pick an actress face, and then at that point, it's really not that big a deal. No, I I don't know the actor's name, but you know who would be do a really good Moon Knight if he wasn't doing other things right now. All right, the guy who played Robin in uh, Titans. Oh yeah, you think you think they would go that young with a Moon Knight character? You don't want to think you don't want to think like late to early forties, maybe late thirties, kind of someone who's been there, done that. He's been battling demons because isn't Moon Knight like suffering from PTSD or is it? Uh... I mean, it, all, it, it depends on which part of the story they focus on, just like with anything else. Yeah. If they're doing, like, origin story, they'd want to go a little, like, late 20s, early 30s. If they're going, been doing this for a while, obviously older. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. You need someone who can, because I think, the, I don't know much about Moon Knight, other than he, I've heard that he's intriguing. And he kind of th- fancies himself to be, like, a, a Batman person, but he's dealing with a lot of mental issues, like split personalities and stuff, I think, are his thing. He's he's basically a far more realistic Batman. Like deals with way more real people stuff than just 
oh god, I'm too rich. What do I do now? Oh. <laughs> Does he have? Is he a millionaire by day, or is he just a regular Joe? If I remember right, he is not rich at all. Yeah. Moon Knight. Uh-oh. Yeah, Moon Knight. Stephen Platt. Oh, the artist. Stephen Platt was that the, the artist. Is that the era that we're talking about? Oh, anything, man. I don't know enough about the character, but I did like... Any of Moon, Moon Knight lore? No, I don't yeah, have any. I, I don't really know a whole lot about him other than he's kind of Batman-ish. And I was going to say, like from that really Stephen Platt era, I thought it was more of like a little, yeah, like a comical uh, uh, Batman kind of deal. Oh, more satirical than for real? I thought so. All right, maybe it is. I don't know. What do you th- Have you guys heard anything about the What If show that they're doing? Not really. Is that no. a Disney Plus? Yeah, it's a Disney Plus show. It's called it's the What If series, and they're going to be all animations. And I think it leaked out that one of the ones that they're doing is what if T'Challa was the leader of the Guardians of the Galaxy instead of the Black Panther? Huh. So it's going to get like fun, cool little stories like that, just little animate like a you know thirty minute animations. I think it'll be fun. Like what if Venom, Venom possessed Deadpool? Yeah, dude, all kinds of stuff. <laughs> you know, I don't know. Because technically Disney can, I think Disney can uh, use the rights to all the Fox people in animation, but they can't do it that's in live action. That's why, I, or so, I th- I'm pretty sure that's the case. I don't know. Something like that. Some sort of arrangement. Like they can have them in animation, but not fully in live action. I don't know. All right, well, tell reminds, me where... It reminds me of the uh, background on my kid's phone. It's Pikachu being possessed by Venom. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, that Pikachu movie turned out to be a lot better than I thought it was going to be. I, I enjoyed it. I don't even have kids. Like, I just watched it by myself. Like, my kids are too old for that <laughs> shit, but I watched it anyway. Tell me more about a website and information that I can find your comic book. So right now, uh, it's... Everything's through our Facebook page, Pathway CF Superhero. Um, and then as we start to get more traction with either putting this Kickstarter together and with our um, our charitable partner, we're going to be posting up links on there. And then should the demand be there, I think that we'll you know grow into a website and whatnot. Do you have pictures of the some pictures of the artwork and the character on that Facebook page? We do. All righty. So you guys, do you, you guys, guys also? Saw moon, like, all of it. All right. Do you guys post regularly about the project and give updates on the status and stuff? Uh, I wouldn't call it regularly because I mean I post things as we have updates, but I wouldn't say it's any kind of regular scheduled update thing. About once a week or something like that, right? About that, yeah. And as we get more of the pages back from the colors, I think we'll be posting all those up. So we don't want to like really kill or you know spill everything out. But yeah, yeah, yeah. We also got to use it as our content to you know get people excited about the story. Exactly. Well, thank you guys for coming on, man. I'll put all the links in the description. Is there anything that you wanna awesome. you wanna close out with before we go? Jeremiah, that I can think of. <laughs> Just uh, out of look out for our book. Um, we're going to hopefully be hitting printer end of September. So whether we're on the con circuit or if anybody wants to order copies, we can ship them out in the mail. Brian will get you a copy. Um, we'd like to get everyone together so we can actually autograph, you know, get a few autographs on the same book. I don't know if it's your experience, but it's kind of hard when people are working in different states to get that kind of together. But I can imagine that is the case, but I have not been. A, <laughs> I have yet to have fully experienced that. So when we have the books... You'll be uh, one of our first ones to get one. Well, thank you, sir. Absolutely. And thank you, guys. I, I'm, it's so awesome that you guys are doing this and, and that you guys found each other through a Facebook connection group, which is what it's designed to do. And I think that's what social media is designed to do as opposed to post pictures of who you hate or what you hate and what you don't and what you wish other people didn't do. So yeah, to exactly. all those people, yeah. I'd like to give them a big <laughs> fuck you. And thank you guys for coming on and keep doing cool stuff, guys. Awesome. Thanks so much, Brian. And always (laughs) stay creative. It's almost time.